Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed your lunch today and will continue to enjoy that lunch as we begin our program. There are also, I think, dessert items on your table, so please partake and enjoy. We will begin, as we customarily do, with recognitions, and this year especially for those who have graduated from Union Presbyterian Seminary, both Richmond and in Charlotte, in recent years. And so first of all, I would like, and there's only a few of them here, but I'd like to recognize those who have graduated from Richmond or in Charlotte in the year 2020. Would you please stand? You may be seated. And those who have graduated from Union Presbyterian Seminary, Richmond, and in Charlotte in the year 2021, would you please stand? Is there anyone present? All right. And before we recognize other graduates, I also want to recognize those who have graduated, will graduate in the class of 2022, those who have recently graduated from Charlotte campus and those who will graduate from our Richmond campus. Would you please stand? Some are our students. Hurrah! It is so important that we recognize not only our most recent graduates, but those who have graduated in 2020 and 2021, because as many of you know, we were unable to hold commencement ceremonies on our two campuses, and we wanted to be certain to recognize them this day. We value you and we appreciate you. We are now gonna go through a sort of a roll call of those who are celebrating uh, returns to our Union Richmond campus, uh, but are graduates of both Richmond and in Charlotte. I'm gonna ask in this case that you hold applause until the end because we have a lot to recognize, and then we'll give a rousing applause at the end if you would. Those who have graduated in the decade of 2010 through 2019, anyone who's graduated in the 2010s, here we are. Okay. That's okay. They're already breaking the Yeah, yeah, that's right. People rarely follow what I say. That's okay. That's all right. I'm used to that. Okay. Those who graduated in the 2000s. Anybody in the 2000s? Hurrah. Okay. Those graduating in the 1990s. 1990s. All right, there we are. Now, here we're going to have sort of a hoop, 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 hurrah. In the 1980s, there's the class of 1981, 40 years plus one. Let's hear it for the class of 81. They'll want you to. And any others who graduated in the 80s? Okay. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Hurrah. Hurrah. I graduated in the 80s. Okay. I gotcha. Okay. All right. Those who graduated in the 1970s, including the class of 72 for their 50th anniversary. Hurrah. And those who graduated. There you go. All good. All good. Oh, there you go. Hey, we've all been there. Well to go, way to go. All right, uh, anybody here who's graduated in the 1960s? Hurrah, hurrah. Hurrah. And finally, anybody in the class of the 50s, like 52, 57, 
You're with us in spirit, I'm sure. Okay, anybody? All right, let's hear it for all the graduates who have returned. Right, you because are. Always, always have been. Always have been. Yeah. <laughs> so we are grateful for the welcome and the warmth that you have shown us in allowing us to butt in and reunite. And a designated table. Thank you. And you, you are very welcome. You are very welcome. We are always glad to welcome the class of 81. Glad to have you back. Yes, it's always an adjustment to us. We have to take five years to get ready for you again, but this is great to have 40 plus one. Let's hear it again for 81. All right. Um, I want to recognize our uh, Black Alumni Association, which are here, here at this table, and remembering our 2020 Distinguished Alumnus, Reverend Mary Jane, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, the BAA Trailblazer, Cheryl Blow McDowell. Let's hear it for the BAA. All right. There you go. All right, yeah. Harmon's double dipping here. Here we go. He, he can't decide. All right, that's fine. All right. Now I want to recognize all faculty, current and former faculty members. Would you please stand? Hurrah for our faculty. Are there any members of the Union Presbyterian Seminary Board who are here today? They have met last week. We thank God for our board. Thank you. Staff members, former and current staff members of seminary from Richmond and in Charlotte, would you please stand? And while we've recognized the recent graduates, all current students, in addition to those graduating this spring, let's have all current students of Union Presbyterian, Charlotte and Richmond who are here, please stand. Thank you very much. All right, now we're gonna have an update uh, for our alumni and friends uh, from our seminary library, our director and librarian is Christopher Richardson, and I recognize to come and speak for us, Ryan Douthat and Robin McCall. Would you come forward, please? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for allowing us a moment to speak. My name is Robin McCall. I'm the reference librarian. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Douthat, and I'm the director of public and electronic services at the library and also the Director of Archives and Special Collections at the libraries. <laughs> and we want you to know that we are still your library. And we have services for alumni, thanks to generous donations from alumni and others to the Hal Todd Library Without Walls program. We are able to make available to you all kinds of different services, things that you can access from home, databases, encyclopedias, Bible dictionaries, commentary series, all kinds of things. Ryan's gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and all you need to do is activate your library account, your alumni account. Uh, by coming over to the library or calling us or emailing us or whatever you want to do uh, and we can just flip a little switch and get you activated so that you can access those materials. We're going to be doing a, a couple of information sessions this summer uh, in mid-July and in mid-August, one in the afternoon, one in the evening to maximize opportunity for people to be present via Zoom so that you can learn more about the resources, the things that you have freely available to you as alums, and we would love for you to join us. So we've got a couple of handouts over there on the table with the blue check tablecloth, uh, and you can also feel free to stop in when you've got some free time between lectures today. Just come over to the library and say, hey, we'd love to have you back. That's right. What's right? That's right. <laughs> Just to emphasize, we are still your library, so going forward. Um, but like Robin said, we do have a number of high quality scholarly digital resources, and we're adding more and more as they become available. So 
please check back often. Um, we, uh, as Robin mentioned, we have the Anchor uh, Bible Commentary Series that we recently added last fall. We also have the Hermeneia Commentary Series and the International mm -hmm. Critical Commentary Series as well. So we just added that one just this spring. So adding more and more all the time. We also have the Atlas uh, Full Text uh, e-journal database that uh, many of you have used as students. So you're still able to use that as well. So all of this is available in a one-stop shop. It's a page on the library website that will, is accessible. Like, like Robin mentioned, it's easy to get to. Just bookmark it, easy to log in. Um, and if you have any trouble, you know, our contacts are on that page. Um, please check with us. But uh, just to reemphasize, we are still your library. And um, yeah, just glad to have you. Yeah. Thank you. We are indeed so grateful for our library. And sometimes the alums say, you know, what do I do now that I'm an alum? And I say, well, I think you serve the church. But at the same time, you also have access to our seminary resources and our library. So please take advantage of that opportunity. And there are two great opportunities to learn more about that this summer, as I'm sure uh, you have learned. This year, we are also going to be marking the retirement of Dr. Richard Boyce. And I've asked uh, Dean McFadden, Ken McFadden, to come forward and Dr. Brian Blunt to offer their words of appreciation. Ken, would you please come forward? And this is kind of a celebrity roast and toast for yeah. Richard Boyce. Keep, keep it brief. <laughs> I didn't realize a rose spot. <laughs> you, got, you got a few minutes. That opens up some space for you, brother. And I apologize in advance for having my back to you. <laughs> and to you. Richard Boyce has 2020 vision. 20 years in the parish, 20 years on the faculty at Union Presbyterian Seminary. That doesn't mean he's got perfect vision, but it does mean he's got 2020 uncorrected vision. And there's a difference. His vision has allowed him to see the movement of God in the world and to think of how theological education in the 1990s and 2000s can respond to the needs of the ever-changing church to equip people of faith to do God's work in a time and in context where that work is needed perhaps more than ever. Richard's 2020 vision has informed how he has served in teaching courses in pastoral care, in preaching, in worship, in polity, in how he's led travel seminars, and how he has helped others cultivate closer to 2020 vision as they see how God is at move in the world. Richard's 2020 vision, though, is not only defined by his 20 and 20, but also by, as I shared in Charlotte last week, his exegetical prowess. He's a PhD graduate in Bible from this school. Not only did that help him understand how to exegete biblical text, but also life text, church text, cultural text, and the context that provide the pretext for his textual work. I got that from Veronica Thomas. <laughs> I saw her and she inspired me. I saw Veronica Thomas. But exegetical work as a dean is critically important. To get a sense of what students need, to get a sense of who students are, to understand more fully the places where students are called to serve. So Richard's ability to do good exegetical work with 2020 vision is something that has not only blessed the Charlotte campus, but the whole seminary. Not only the Charlotte students, but all students. Not only the Charlotte faculty, but all faculty. Richard, we wish you well. May your vision continue to grow, even beyond 2020. <laughs> When I have been asked to talk with other presidents, I've been doing this business now for 15 years. So I've been asked at times to talk 
to new presidents uh, who are becoming acclimated to their positions. And I start by saying that there are three people who are going to be very important in your role if you're going to be successful. The first will be your spouse. Yes. The second will be probably the chair of your board of trustees. And the third will be your academic dean. Yes. You will come to lean upon your dean in some very important and critical ways. I have been gifted here at Union Presbyterian Seminary with some wonderful deans, and one of them is Richard Boyce. He has been a friend. He has been a confidant. We have argued and debated. We have thought together and strategized. And we have collectively considered the welfare of this seminary, particularly the Charlotte campus, and how to make it stronger for God's work in the world. Richard has been with the Charlotte campus since it formed. He was one of the initial professors, and he became really, in my mind, the heir apparent in terms of academic deanship when Tom Curry came to me and said that it was time for him to retire. And it wasn't just me who had that perception. It was almost everybody except Richard on the Charlotte <laughs> campus. Richard had to discern the moment, but everybody else Still was convinced. Voted, Is that right? <laughs> everybody else was convinced that he was the person who could take us to the next phase. When you talk to the students, when you talk to the faculty, when you talk to the community, the friends of Union Presbyterian Seminary in Charlotte, they recognize the gift we have in Richard. He's been not just a resource for the Board of Trustees, not just a resource for me as president, but a wonderful resource for the students and a wonderful resource for the faculty. And in many ways, has helped make Charlotte's vision more expansive in that region. So I'm thankful, Richard, that you have come from the church, from politics, and now into the seminary world of theological education and have gifted us with your insight with your grace, with your passion, and with your love of the students, and with your joy and collegiality with the faculty. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time sharing with you in this administrative role, the, sh the roles that we share together. And you know how much I congratulate you on this moment, and I tried to get you to think about doing it at a later time, you know that as well. <laughs> but I'm grateful to God for the time we've been able to serve together and certainly wish you and Kathleen great, great opportunities for love, fellowship, fun, travel, whatever you want to do in these days to come. God bless you, Richard. Thank you. My friends, Dr. He, Richard Boyce. He always has something to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be very, very brief. There's a joke about 2020. I had had cataract surgery here recently, so I need all kind of assistance <laughs> to see clearly. And I think we, none of us, see clearly alone. We only see clearly with one another. Uh, in fact, I think I'd have to say, since they really didn't roast me much, uh, many people perceive me as the insider's insider, and I can understand that. I'm the son and grandson of ministers. I went to Davidson College, and then I came to Union Presbyterian. It looks like it was all planned out. Uh, no, no. That's second tier. Yeah, okay. I, no, no. Oh, uh, no, no. But from my perspective, uh, I haven't been clear about what I'm supposed to be doing from the word go. I just talked to Deborah Cochran, and she said, I remember talking to you before you decided to go sh to Charlotte. And I said, Deborah, what do you remember about that? You were very undecided. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I came to Union on a trial year fellowship. Why? Because I couldn't decide between medical school or English grad school. 
Isn't God funny, right? <laughs> I came within a whisper of saying no to the graduate fellowship I was presented when I finished studying here because I thought it was time to get out into the church. If I had not stayed and gotten that PhD, I would not have been able to enter the faculty at Charlotte. The big one was leaving the parish to come to the seminary. We, Kathleen and I have four, count them, four daughters who were getting ready to go into college right at that point. The Charlotte campus had about 12 potential students, no accreditation, and no history. And I was leaving a well-established parish position to come teach. Talk to Kathleen about some <laughs> of that decision time, but I went forward. Probably the silliest of all is when Tom Curry stepped aside. I was in a sweet little office, Brian, up on the second floor, right? Where Carson Brisson has staked himself out now. <laughs> That was a sweet spot up there, right? In fact, it was so quiet up there, I decided to become a mayor for eight years to give my life a little bit of pizzazz, right? I, I haven't been able to decide where I fit all through my life, and yet Union Presbyterian Seminary has welcomed me each and every step of the way. I think I get this primarily from my father, uh, how would I put this? I, I think I was nurtured in the school of applied midrash. <laughs> really. You think about it a little bit, you exegete a little bit of the text and the context, and then you get out there, and you practice, and you come back and think again. I have deep respect and deep admiration from some of my more scholarly colleagues one of whom is sitting right there, Francis Taylor Ginch. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for the fruit that comes from that hard work of disciplined scholarship. But I also want to celebrate the good fruit that comes from a mix of things. I'm known on the Charlotte campus. Why was I excited about the Charlotte campus? I said, all right, y'all. Theological education is getting ready to be messy. Right? Why? We only got four faculty down there. We got to do cross-disciplinary stuff to stay alive. We were birthed by congregations who were watching us and engaged with us every day and every year that we were there. We had to fly with the accreditation and the support of our home campus or we would have never gotten started. We had to be in the mix and we had to learn to be a community together. Right? That's what's fun. That's what draws me. And I thank Union Presbyterian Seminary for inviting me to do a host of things, of which I'm still uncertain, right? <laughs> but deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you. And we, we came this close one time to hanging up the phone on one another, Brian and I, but we, we, we made it. We made it. <laughs> We made it not only with our working relationship, but our friendship intact. And y'all, that's a miracle of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> for which I'm very grateful. And blessings on those who will follow. Ken, bless you for stepping forward to serve as dean. Thanks, Lisa McLennan, for stepping up to be our next vice president down on the campus. Thanks for faculty who continue to be with us, uh, pray for Rodney Sadler, who's the only remaining member of the original yes. team. But pray for our students on both campuses and get ready. Uh, we worship a God of the unexpected, yes. right? Hallelujah. And I can't wait to see what new things God has in store for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> We now come to our luncheon program, and I'll just offer a brief word of introduction of our president, Brian Blunt. Six days ago, Dr. Blunt announced to the seminary board, faculty, staff, leadership in our community that he will be retiring. And immediately, as alumni director, a number of alums were in touch with me, and they said, I'm just devastated. I'm so sad 
And then they put the question to me, aren't you sad? <laughs> and Brian, with all true honesty, no, I'm not sad. <laughs> and the reason is I am thankful. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that in 2007, I received word as I was a pastor in the Northern Neck that Union Presbyterian Seminary had named Brian Blunt to be its seventh president. I was thankful the year later, here at these front lectures, when I gathered with many of you on the quadrangle when we attended his inauguration. I was thankful as a parish minister to know that the seminary that I attended was being so well led. And then, six years ago, I was thankful to have the opportunity to come and join the staff of this seminary as alum director. I'm thankful not only for Brian, but for Sharon Blunt and for the leadership that they have shown to us over these 15 years. Amen. Thankful that we still have another 14 months to enjoy them. So please join me in expressing our thanks to God for our president, Dr. Brian Blunt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't have the words to express. Um, as my dad would often say, I'm all filled up. Uh, uh, Sharon and I are very grateful and thankful for these 15 years and for the next 14 months. And we have, um, as we've talked about uh, things that are coming next, uh, as we look into the future, we are doing so with a grateful heart about what has been the present and the past. Mm. This has been a wonderful, wonderful ministry, and I'm grateful to God for it. Um, I think of, uh, you know, the, as we started um, in this, in this uh, some of the early memories, um, Clay talking about the inauguration, which I remember very vividly out here on the are quad. Are you ready? On the, are you ready? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I don't know that we were, Brown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, um, that. Yeah, that have these wonderful images. I see Kate sitting over there, and uh, one of the first students I met um, uh, in my role um, in an individual circumstance, uh, Jessica Tate had been um, uh, awarded a, 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 a what is it? Um, a, which church was that, Madison Kate? Avenue. Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. Yeah, um, she was awarded a preaching fellowship. She was preaching in uh, Madison Avenue. I was still in Princeton, and um, I heard that was taking place. And I said, "Hey, one of my students now. One of my students is yeah. preaching in New York." So I got on the train and went up. Well, I guess I drove up that day. But um, not only did I get to meet Jessica, but I got to meet Kate. And uh, I thought, well, these are some wonderful students. I'm going to be a part of this wonderful community. Got to meet the family and all of that. So that was kind of one of my first introductions to recognizing I feel a part of this community. Even though it was in New York, um, I was coming to uh, Richmond and Charlotte, but already I began to sense I'm a part of this community. I have a couple of announcements before I share some words about the seminary. Um, first, um, I've been um, tasked to invite all of you from the BAA um, to know that uh, membership is open if you would like to be a member of the Black Alumni Association. Um, they have uh, open membership and would want you to know that you're welcome should you like to be involved in actually what is now the only continually functioning alumni organization of the seminary. They meet, they meet continually. <laughs> They meet continually and they gift the seminary in some significant ways. Um, they'll be meeting tomorrow afternoon for their annual meeting, which they do every um, year after Sprunts. So um, please uh, know that you're welcome and uh, there are folk here at the two tables um, who would uh, be happy to talk with you about it. You don't have it. to be black to join. 
They, yeah, that, I, was trying, I was trying to let that slide on in there, uh, but that, that's right. You don't have to be black to join. Uh, the uh, second is I wanted you to know that um, we have just recently passed by SACCOC and ATS our 10-year reaffirmation of accreditation. Not only did we do so, but we did so if we were grading, I think we would have gotten an A because we were not asked to do any follow-up activities for any of that material that we were. We were considered to be quite a strong seminary. We have much to be proud of in that regard. Um, I'm excited about the way in which our school, through its self-study and through the compliance issues and through its quality enhancement plan, um, demonstrated its value and its strength. So I want you to know that for the next 10 years, we are going to be riding on a wonderful high. <laughs> and whoever is in my place 10 years from now, you know, they, um, you know, they've got to do as well as I did. That's all I got to say. On the morning when it happened, I was anxious. I wanted to tell every one of them, almost 400 individually, face to face. I grew up in small town Smithfield, Virginia, just an hour and a half southeast of here. We didn't lock our doors and we acted like everybody was family. In my segregated elementary school, my teachers were friends of my parents. When my teacher spoke, I could hear the cadence of my mom's voice backed up by the threat of my dad's authority. <laughs> They knew that I knew that my parents were just a quick phone call away or a visit. My teachers, like my aunts and uncles and grandparents and neighbors and friends and church members, could at any time show up at my house. And I, dragged by my mom or dad, could show up at any one of their houses at any time unannounced and enter without even bothering to knock. Right. Many was the late afternoon or early evening I was sitting in the den at the television or camped out at the dining room table doing some homework, my mom laboring in the kitchen, my dad on a tractor in the field, and the door to the house had just opened by itself. Someone would poke their head in, smiling and waving and say, coming in. <laughs> and then they just came in because they were just dropping by to say hello. Or Brian did something that Brian shouldn't have done in school today and they were here to report on it. Or something was amiss at the church, and would Deacon Blunt and my dad have a moment to chat about it? Well, you're already in the house, I'd be thinking, looking up from my notes. Of course he has a moment. What's he going to say? I'm not home right now? In my growing up days in my small town, when people needed to tell you something, especially something important, they didn't pick up the phone. They got in the car. They drove to your house. They walked in your house like they were family, and they talked with you face to face. All right. It was a long time before I outgrew this aspect of Smithfield in me. Every once in a while, I feel a moment of deja vu, like when I'm going to someone's house for a big social gathering, a party, a seminary reception, and the front door is open, only the storm door is blocking the entrance. I can see in, and even if I can't see anybody, because I know they're in another part of the house, I know they're expecting company, I just open the door and holler out, coming in. <laughs> that feels so country. But you can get away with being country in the city if there's a party and you're expected. Um, All right. In Smithfield, in the country, you were always expected. You didn't go roaming around your own house in your pajamas or lay out napping on your own couch in your underwear <laughs> because anybody, including the pastor, might just show up and walk in. Well, you might be asking, why don't you just lock the door and go take that nap worrying or not worrying whatever you want it to? Well, because then the pastor shows up and instead of opening the unlocked door and walking in and yelling, coming in, his country momentum expecting an unlocked door causes him to walk smack in the face into a door that doesn't open when he expects it to open. And the next Sunday he's up preaching about how Deacon Blunt locks his door <laughs> because God only knows what is going on in Deacon Blunt's house <laughs> or something like that. You know that saying of Jesus at the end of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. 
Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep on the couch in your underwear <laughs> when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. I lived that scripture growing up in Smithfield, Virginia, and I carried that living with me into the one and only pastorate that I'm probably now ever going to have. Taught to talk to folks face to face, not over the phone about important stuff back in 1983 when I wanted to communicate personally with my church members or with people who had just visited the church for the first time on a Sunday morning. I went cold calling on Wednesday night. I was minister of a congregation in the city of Newport News but I was still all country. You know the saying, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. And I was living in that circumstance. Just starting out, 24 years old, paper map on the front passenger seat beside me, flashlight on the top of the map so I could flick it on and read the map on those dark Wednesday evenings, and I just started finding my way to people's homes and apartments. Unannounced. The doors were locked, so I had to knock, but that didn't deter me. I had something to say that Carver Church was their home and I was their pastor, or that Carver Church could be their home and I could be their pastor. I knew from growing up that you didn't share that kind of message on the phone. You spoke it in their living room, at their kitchen table, in their den while the ball game was playing. My very first Wednesday night, I rang the doorbell at the apartment of a woman who had visited the church on Sunday. And she opened it, and she squinted into the darkness, she focused on my face, and she recognized who it was, and I, she thought I could tell from her expression, now what the hell is this? <laughs> I thought, she thought that she was living in some alternative Christian mission craze universe. <laughs> Reverend Blunt, she inquired. Smiling, I just started walking my way past her, showing myself in. Yes, I answered, looking around for a place to sit and have a conversation. I cannot remember her name, but I said her name then, and then I spent the next 20 minutes talking about why she should join Carver Church. And she did, by the way. <laughs> and no, I would not do anything near as country, near as stupid nowadays. <laughs> But back then I was undeterred. I left her place to the home, to go to the home of a family of church members. I rang their doorbell. I got their confused and shocked facial expressions. I went on in and I talked about Carver Church for 20 minutes. I was a Wednesday night apparition who just materialized, unannounced. Pretty soon when I arrived at people's homes, I was the one shocked. Church members were ready for me. I would arrive to tea or some other drink and snacks or pastries. And after this kept happening, I finally asked one couple whether they and other Carver folk just randomly kept festive drinks and desserts sitting around at their house all day. And they smiled and said, no, we know what you're doing on Wednesday nights. <laughs> and nobody wants to be caught unprepared. So we're all just getting stuff out in case on a particular Wednesday, it's our Wednesday. And it took you long enough to come around to our house. We were starting to wonder whether you were going to leave us out. They weren't leaving the door unlocked, but they were ready for the crazy preacher to just show up. Seems like this country boy was countrifying his city church folk. I spent seven years sitting in kitchens eating, watching families cook and do the dishes, lounging in living rooms in deep conversation, laughing and joking in dens while the television blasted away in the background, walking around garages that had been turned into workshops, all the while sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, face to face, like I learned to do growing up. Which is why it broke my heart that I wasn't able to tell each and every one of those members face to face now that despite the fact that I love them with all my heart, it was time for me to leave. My church secretary, who was phenomenal, even if in 1988 she thought computers were of the devil and would therefore not acquiesce to trying one out, I was myself just learning to use a computer on a Radio Shack Tandy 1000 
five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives to store the data I was compiling. I, I wanted to use it to draft my sermons, but my secretary wouldn't touch the demonic thing. <laughs> I had to write my sermons out longhand for her to type, but she was a great typist and she was an even greater mimeographer. We had this mimeograph machine that printed out our bulletins every Sunday. And we had this church newsletter. The internet was just a gleam in some physicist's eye at the time, so email did not exist, of course, but we had a newsletter. I would write it out longhand along with other church members. Betty would type it up and mimeograph it into five or 600 copies because the newsletter often had eight or nine or 10 pages with many of those copies. That was too much collating for her to do by herself, so she rounded up a group of retired church members to be her newsletter team. They'd come in, spend the morning or afternoon doing the collating, stapling, folding, wrapping so we could put the finished products into a big bulk mailing bag and have somebody cart the heavy bag off to the post office. The team was there in the church basement this afternoon where my pastor's office was. The cover article in this particular issue was my resignation letter. My announcement was that I was leaving them to head to Emory University's PhD program in New Testament studies. Chief of Police at the time was a member of the church and he came up to me after he had gotten the newsletter and he said, well, Reverend Blunt, I can't be angry with you. I would have been angry if you had been going to a bigger church, but you're going to make something better of yourself and we're proud of you. The night before, I had spent four hours driving from house to house to the home of each and every one of my session members so that I could tell them face to face. Looking in the faces of the newsletter team that afternoon, guilt lay softly like a blanket over my sadness, guilty because there was still so much in front of that church and I wanted to do all I could to ensure that they would reach the goals we had set together. Sad because even though I walked among them, I was feeling less and less like I was one of them, or so I thought. Over the next several weeks, member after member sought me out knocking on the door of my study, which I always kept closed because even the tiniest noise disrupts my sensitive thought processes. They would say, some of them laughingly, coming in, Reverend Blunt. <laughs> we celebrated each other, them coming in, me going out. I say that saying goodbye to Carver Memorial Presbyterian Church was the hardest transition I have ever made in my life. Perhaps because it wasn't just me, but by this point, a family, Sharon, our two-year-old son, Joshua, was involved. And I was leaving them, I felt, at a critical moment in the life of our community. We just finished this phenomenal fundraising drive. We'd broken ground on a new church building, a host of new families had joined, new ministries were underway, and in the midst of all of that, I was sure that God was calling me to move on. When it's God time, when it's God's time, you can start off resisting, but ultimately you go. But the bond has remained strong. I went back to preach at the dedication of that new church building. I've been back multiple times to preach at some of the church's signature events. Those of you who will remember, at my inauguration, the church choir yep. was yep. here singing. And I'll go this fall to preach for their 130th anniversary. Carver is like home. When I go back, the door feels like it's unlocked. I still feel good just wandering on in. And when I wander in, there is gonna be this wall where all of these preachers who've been there in the past are up there on the wall hanging framed and there's gonna be a 30 year old Brian Blunt <laughs> looking back at this, you know, something whatever year old I am right now. <laughs> I have thought much in these past days about leaving Carver as I now contemplate next year when I will leave UP Sim. After much prayer, consultation with Sharon, and consideration about some of the things I would love to do while I have passion and energy for doing them, I have come to realize that it is time. I really wish that in the year to come, I will have every opportunity to share face to face with students and faculty and staff and you alums and trustees and seminary friends just how much my time here has transformed me in such wonderful ways. 
I'm not saying that every moment was a wonderful moment, <laughs> but the experience itself taken in its fullness was indeed one for me of absolute wonder. I'm deeply grateful to the search committee that called me, believed in me, and trusted that I had the ability to do this job. And I'm grateful to the trustees who have been a deep support for me in moments good and bad. I'm grateful for those faculty colleagues who have envisioned with me new ways of thinking together about theological education. And I treasure every single one of the students who have been the constant source of my wonder in this job. How God calls and shapes and gives this seminary opportunity to nurture and equip is the miraculous part of this calling as the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary. And even as I contemplate my own time in this calling coming to an end on June 30th of 2023, I peer out into the future and see great things happening for UPSIM because of the groundwork that has been so carefully laid across what will be more than a decade and a half of our work together. So I want to do what I've so often done when I've had a chance to speak at these front lectures. I want to tell you why I'm excited not only about where UPSIM is, but why I'm excited about where UPSIM is going. Let me start with our students and share with you what I just shared with our trustees. If we take a comparative look at the materials on things like admissions, we recently received ATS data which compares UPSIM with peer PCUSA seminaries of like size and mission. In 2021 as in 2020 for the core MDiv degree, UPSIM yielded much higher numbers of applications, acceptances, and enrollment numbers for the MDiv degree than our peer averages. In fact, our numbers in all three categories went up while the averages in the categories for our peers went down. We do note, of course, with Thanksgiving, we're the only school that has two campuses. For the non-MDiv degrees, we do find ourselves a little below the peer averages, but now that we've added the Master of Arts in Public Theology, I'm looking forward to seeing how we're going to do in that category as well. For the D-men, we limit ourselves to 10 admits a year, so we won't be as high in numbers there, but we will be as strong in quality of graduates. I also want to point out that our graduation and placement rates are very strong. I'd be concerned if we had difficulty retaining, graduating, or placing our students, but we are not having difficulty in those areas, which suggests that we're admitting strong students still. Graduation rates for all categories are higher than those of our peer institutions. So is our placement rate. In fact, you can find these figures on our website. There we note that 89.9% .9 of our class of 2020 graduates had positions within one year of graduation. Our student body remains quite strong in the classroom, in the church, in the world. Regarding enrollment, we also do well in terms of the core MDiv program. Headcount of 131 as compared to a peer average of 76. FTE of 121 as compared to a peer average of 64. Other interesting data regarding enrollment categories, women make up 64% of our student body. The average is 51%. Racial ethnic, 23% of our students are from racial ethnic underrepresented groups. The peer average is 47%. So we've got work to do in this area. In fact, that was raised with me by our ATS accreditation visiting team. I do believe, though, that the building of a more diverse faculty, which is happening right now, will be instrumental in making us more attractive to a broader array of the applicant pool. The recruitment of students from Africa and Asia and the Middle East will be helpful in this regard. Regarding faculty, you'll note that we have the largest, or you would note if you could see the data like I do, <laughs> that we have the largest full-time faculty amongst our PCUSA peers, 23. The peer median is 13. Now, of course, again, we've got two campuses. But note, when you see the numbers, as I do, we do much better in utilizing fewer part-time faculty. Whereas in 2021, our school employed only five part-time faculty adjuncts, that is, the peer high was 51, the peer median was 17. In other words, we want our students to work with full-time faculty, especially for their core class programs. We are 
building a faculty of people who are with our students on both campuses in a full-time way. As you know, we have a wonderfully strong curriculum taught by our wonderful faculty. For decades, our students have been nourished and equipped by an excellent program of theological education taught by excellent scholars who are researching and writing in the fields that they teach. Complementing the work of the faculty in the curriculum and more and more intersecting with that work is the educational ministry established in the work of the seminary's three centers. The Sigmund Rhee Global Mission Center for Christian Education has established memorandums of understanding, partnership agreements with more than 20 theological schools and churches around the globe. Director James Tonetti has incorporated into these relationships the opportunities for these schools and churches to send scholars and students to study on our Richmond campus so that we might learn from them, even as the students engage our faculty and their student colleagues in the classroom and for us to send students to study and visit and travel seminars and exchange classes around the world. As an example of how this work is progressing now that we are moving out of the pandemic, just next year we anticipate two PhD students coming to study from India in the fall, and we've admitted a wonderful group of students who hope to find visa and financial clearance to come and study in our master's programs. I suspect not all of those students will clear their hurdles before them, but listen to where Dr. Tanetti's work has made, what Dr. Tanetti's work has made possible. International students who would come from Ghana, from Korea, from Egypt, from Jamaica, from Ethiopia, from Kenya, from Liberia, from Nigeria, from India, next year. Wow. As a matter of fact, I had a meeting this morning, concern for the fact that there are going to be so many international students potentially on our campus, we need to figure out how we can best be hospitable as a community to make sure that they can find their way as strangers in a new land. The Cato Geneva Cannon Center for Womanist Leadership under the direction of Dr. Mel uh, Dr. Elect, I guess is the way it was put. The Reverend Melanie Jones has developed just as an exciting body of work. She's getting ready to do that dissertation defense. In the midst of the pandemic, it hosted a virtual gathering that drew womanist scholars and students from around the globe. It is sponsored now leadership educational programs by leading womanist scholars. And it has worked with the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation to hold an excellent array of webinars on key topics related to concerns for women of color and broader issues of justice and inclusion. And speaking of the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation, its director, Dr. Rodney Sadler, has not only coordinated with the Center for Womanist Leadership, but has developed strong programs of conversation and engagement in the Charlotte community and around the country with his justice-oriented work. All three centers are focused on connecting with the classroom in vital ways. Perhaps there's no stronger tie-in to the curriculum for the centers than through the new Master of Arts in Public Theology. The MAPT offers both an academic degree and a certificate program. And to make its reach as broad as possible, the program is a hybrid-based one where students can do most of their work online, coordinating that with a short time of on-campus work with faculty and peers. This new program has, in its first year, recruited a strong number of students to UP Sims Richmond campus. And speaking of the hybrid model and its draw for students, the faculty has voted that starting this upcoming fall, the master's program in Charlotte will move to a hybrid format. This means that instead of needing to travel to campus every single weekend throughout the academic year, Charlotte students will be able to do their work, much of it online, and then travel to campus four Saturdays each semester. I'm excited for how this change of schedule and format will allow us to open up even more the reach of the Charlotte campus to students who want to do theological education, but to do it in a flexible way. This move to explore more ways of using technology on both campuses to broaden the reach of theological education is one of the key planks of our current strategic plan. The other is a focus on diversifying the faculty and student body so that the school and its work looks more like the church and the world into which our students will be doing God's work. As we work to bring students from different cultures and communities through the work of the Global Mission Center, we also hope 
As current faculty retire to broaden the perspective and diversity of the faculty as new faculty are called into this ministry. As I noted earlier, ATS data indicated that UP Sim has a faculty of 23. Almost half that number, 11, has come to UP Sim since 2018. And they have come from a variety of places in life and locations around the country and the world. I mentioned James Tanetti from India, Ruben Arjona, Mexico, Rachel Bard, South Africa, Melanie Jones, U.S. African American, Professor Lakeisha Lockhart, U.S. African American, Professor Safwat Marzouk, Egypt. Just recently, we've called Dr. Dorothy Tripodi to be full time. While these professors will be based in Richmond, new faculty calls are also underway in Charlotte, church history, practical theology, and theology. By June 2023, this influx of faculty in Charlotte will have a powerful impact across both campuses. And other changes, administrative in nature, are coming. With the retirement of Richard Boyce, the school will move to a structure that has one academic dean across two campuses. We will move to have two deans of students, one in Richmond, and a new position of Vice President for Administration and Dean of Students for the Charlotte campus. Michelle Walker will continue in this role for Richmond. Lisa McLennan will move into this role on the Charlotte campus. As the change in delivery format to a hybrid model in Charlotte expects to create a situation where more Charlotte students become full-time, we have also changed the way we do financial aid so that Charlotte and Richmond students will have equal access to the kind of scholarship aid for full-time students that covers tuition and hopes to create a situation where students, all of them, either campus full-time, are able to graduate with a little bit. The library continues to grow and thrive under the direction of Dr. Christopher Richardson. I'm most excited about the continuing work of the Hal Todd Library Without Walls program. As the library acquires more and more electronic resources, I hope that you Alums are taking full advantage by taking advantage of the ability to access the library from your computer or mobile devices to do research from your home or office studies when you are unable to come physically to the library. You can be anywhere in the world these days, and as long as you have the internet, you have the William Smith Morton Library. I could go on because exciting things are happening. We're in the midst of raising funds to endow the new position of Vice President and Dean of Students on the Charlotte campus with the John and Missy Kirkendall Endowment Fund. You are welcome to contribute to it any time you would like. <laughs> or if you would like to contribute to something that is brick and mortar, we are in the process of rest renovating Westminster Hall so that it will become the home to the Leadership Institute and the William Klein Center at the Leadership Institute. Once that transformation takes place, we will not only have an up-to-date conference center complete with suites to house visitors on their campus stays, but we will have moved every operation on the Richmond campus to this historic quadrangle. This means that when church leaders come to campus for continuing education, they will be in the heart of the campus with easy ability to engage faculty, students, and the library. So much is going on here at UPSIM. If I had more time, I could talk with you about other things. I'm going to be at this point, though, attentive to the time that we have and hope that you will do some research on the website or talk to our faculty, talk to our students, talk to our staff members, and find out the things that are happening around our schoolhouse. Much is happening, much is being planned, and all of that will extend through the remainder of the current strategic plan and stretch into the work of the strategic plan that the next president will put in place. Like Lewis Weeks before me, I will look on from a distance, proud, thankful, and perhaps most importantly, quiet, <laughs> as this seminary continues its wonderful work of theological education for the next generation of leaders for God's church in God's world. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Blunt. His roast is yet to come. Right? His roast is yet to come, to be, to be scheduled. Just some closing announcements, uh, a word of thanks. They're not all here, but in absentia, I'd like to thank our student workers who served us for our meals. Some are here, thank you. Our thanks also to our advancement staff, my colleagues Nicole Smith, Mike Frontiero, Bernie Howell, Lynn Battle, Evelyn Terry, Aslan Kane, who is back there doing our audiovisual, and Richard Wong, our leader. Richard's last front lectures as he will be retiring next April. I wanted to announce that class pictures will be taken after our luncheon. Uh, they will be on the steps of the Morton Library. So, of course, the class of 81, 40 plus 1, the BAA and others, yes. please, and other uh, alums who wish to gather there on the steps, please do so following our luncheon. Just go out the door to your left. Uh, there will be opportunity for alumni groups to meet this afternoon. Uh, the class of 81, you'll be in the early center room 106. We call it the Thompson room. You would remember it as the uh, reference, um, I'm sorry, the, the reserve reading room in the old Spence Library, but that's early center 106. And other classrooms are available if other classes wish to join Together, you may see me and I have room assignments for you. Uh, BAA annual meeting will be tomorrow afternoon, as Brian mentioned, at 2 o'clock. That also in the early center in room 124, the congregation's room. Um, later today, we will have a cookout. Uh, it's scheduled for the quadrangle at 4 o'clock. It may be in this room. Just stay tuned. Our evening lecture will be at 6 o'clock in the Watts Chapel with book signing afterwards. And next year I wanted to announce that our Sprunt Lectures will be on May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 2023, and that our Sprunt Lecturer is Dr. Kerry Day, who is Associate Professor of Constructive Theology and African American Religion at Princeton Theological Seminary. So please come join us for our Sprunt Lectures in 2023. I now invite you to stand as we join in our benediction. This is a benediction my father used and I hope you will indulge me in offering it to you. Go now in the knowledge that in the goodness of God you were born. In the providence of God you are kept all the day long. And in the love of God fully revealed in Jesus Christ you have each one been redeemed for a purpose. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. <laughs>